So, uh, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, cross manage or managing cross team resources at scale, uh, and uh, particularly with Kubernetes uh, and how you would do that. Um, so, how many folks actually went to Kubicon? Uh, so, uh, a few of you. Okay, not everybody, but uh, quite a few of you. Um, so, um, I'm not going to kind of. This is not going to be like a one-on-one -on -one talk about uh, Kubernetes. I'm going to kind of assume you know a little bit about Kubernetes, but uh, I'll be talking about how you can use uh, Kubernetes uh, to manage uh, resources uh, with multiple teams. So. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm, my name's Ian Lewis. I'm uh, a developer advocate on the Google Cloud Platform team. Uh, I'm based in Tokyo, Japan, so I kind of uh, flew out here for Kubecon. I'm usually, uh, I usually covering APAC, so I fly around in uh, Seoul and, uh, you know, Taipei and like all the other places in, uh, in APAC. Uh, and I'm on Twitter and stuff like that, so you can kind of follow me there. So, um, I'm going to move kind of quickly because I don't have a whole lot of time. But uh, so uh, basically, the problem that I want to solve is like so you have a, a cluster uh, of you know Kubernetes resources or, or resources that you want to manage uh, with you know multiple services or multiple apps or environments or teams. Uh, so you want to be able to kind of segment the uh, the uh, resources that you have. Um, and so you might have things like you know development environments. Um, you know, I might have like uh, you know your database apps that like your DB admins manage, uh, or like you have service A and B, and those are managed by different teams. Uh, those type of things. So, uh, how do you actually manage the resources within a cluster when like you don't actually uh, you're not managing the the machine or the uh, services per uh, per server? So the kind of naive way to like do kind of cross team uh, management of resources is to like do everything by uh, per server. So you might have like a, each server kind of dedicated to a particular app or uh, a particular environment, and then uh, then each team kind of manages a set of those servers. So here you might have like just your cache tier and database tier and web tier, uh, and those would be managed each by different teams uh, or by different people, and the uh, and each of those might not be like uh, homogeneous. They might be kind of heterogeneous. You might have this batch machine over there that's really beefy and has a, you know, a lot of CPU cores and, and memory. Uh, but your web servers like don't have quite as much. Um, so you might have this kind of like homogeneous setup. But in a kind of cluster or a, a, a um, clusterized like kind of containerized uh, world, uh, things can kind of, will be. Uh, quite different. Uh, so you need to kind of forget everything that you know up until this point. You need to kind of like uh, go back to basics and, and think about how the, uh, the, um, you want to actually segment the resources that you've got in your, uh, in your cluster. So if you think back like very in, uh, abstractly, uh, don't think about the servers uh, themselves. Uh, just think about, if you kind of think about it, like you've got this pool of a bunch of machines, but really the resources that you want to be dividing up are things like CPU cores or CPU cycles and uh, memory and disks. And you want to like allocate specific amounts of those cycles and cores and disks uh, to different teams or different environments. And uh, then on top of that, you want to be able to utilize each of those as much as possible. So like if you uh, segment them by machine, you're kind of, you are segmenting them by, by cores and memory, but you're not actually you know, utilizing a lot of the, uh, or utilizing the resources as much as you could be. So in a Kubernetes world, you would have a bunch of uh, homogeneous machines and a single cluster, and then you run the different applications um, within the cluster. Uh, and the, the uh, Kubernetes will actually schedule each of those in the cluster uh, in a way that uh, tries to utilize the, the resources in the, uh, the best possible way. Um, but you're not actually segmenting by machine. You're actually, um, you might actually have uh, things from your, your different environments actually running side by side on the same machine. Uh, but Kubernetes kind of manages them in such a way that uh, logically you're giving uh, certain resources to each environment, uh, but they might actually be spread out among, among, among a bunch of different machines. So if you went to KubeCon like you, and you watched uh, um, uh, the, the keynote, 
uh, at the end, where um, where uh, Kelsey plays Tetris, um, then you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. But um, a really good way of, of talking about this is actually uh, showing is or a good analogy is is Tetris. So so each of your teams has like kind of a namespace. So you can think of kind of the width and the height here. This is actually not really real time, so. Uh, uh, you'll have to kind of bear with me, but um, the you can kind of imagine that the width and the height here are like this is like CPU and this is like memory, and each of these are like your actual servers or processes, and um, they they take up a certain amount of memory or, or CPU, and they get allocated and scheduled within the namespace. And each of your teams basically has their own kind of namespace that they can work with to actually put their resources in it, and that's and then you can you can actually set kind of quotas. So that the uh, the width and the height or the size of their their little namespace uh, is determined by the the quota that they're actually given uh, to work with. So if you have an environment, say a development environment, you might not want to give it as much uh, resources as say production, and so you'll have like kind of a smaller namespace to work with. Uh, but depending on the the environment that you're talking about, that's actually that would actually be okay. So I'm going to kind of go through and, and demo like a little bit about like what that actually looks like in Kubernetes. Um, I'm going to kind of ask uh, somebody to hold this mic here. That would be uh, awesome. Yes, my mic man. I brought him just for this. So um, so here's my terminal, and I'm going to go to my quota demo and actually. This is a little in the way, so I'm going to make this smaller. So um, what I've got here is I've got a, uh, a couple of uh, namespaces, like say a front end and a back end, and maybe those are managed by different teams. Uh, I'm only going to really talk about the front end because I, well, I do have a quite a bit of time, but I'll have a, um, so I'll talk about mostly the front end first, at least. Um, so what you do is basically uh, in Kubernetes is you'll create a namespace for each of your, your different teams or environments. And uh, this could be like any combination of things. It could be like your front-end production, and you could have front-end production, back-end production, back-end dev, back-end production, you know, like. And so you could have any number of, or any combination of things, things. Like each of your developers could each, each have their own namespace, for instance. Um, so you, what you'll do is you actually create a namespace, and that becomes the, the hook that you use to actually set quotas and things like that. And then um, from there, you'll actually, uh, you can create uh, quotas for the namespace. And then this is basically just uh, allows you to set, set limits on uh, how big the namespace is or how many resources that are allocated to that namespace. So here I'm going to, like, uh, create a resource quota that is um, that allows you one gigabyte of memory uh, and gives you uh, two CPUs, TP CPUs cores, and uh, you can also set uh, limits on the number of pods or the number of services uh, or the number of replication controllers and other types of uh, of actual of resources within Kubernetes. But what I'm going to talk mostly about today is is the memory and CPU uh, that you can. Uh, Limit your uh, your your environment by. So uh, first, I'm going to create. Uh, I think I might have created the namespaces already. Yeah, that's already there. Um, so I'm going to uh, create the front end quota. Actually, no. I need to actually create the front end quota in the particular namespace that I'm creating, doing. Uh, so namespace equals front end prod. Oh. Oh, I actually have one already there. That's not right. So, so there you can create the front end, the uh, the quota using the uh, the Kube control uh, command. Um, and so there I've created, I've just created a quota within the namespace, but I don't have actually anything running there right now. Um, so 
what I'm going to do is actually create a re replication controller. Um, but uh, first, I want to talk about um, the the fact that so now we've actually limited the the, uh, the namespace to a particular size. Um, but we might also want to do things like limit the uh, the pods or the controller or the the containers to their to their uh, to a particular size also. So you can do what is uh, you can create what is called limits and what limits are, are is basically the same thing as for a namespace, but you actually uh, set those on a per pod uh, or per container basis. So here, um, I'm actually going to create what's called a limit, what's a, or create a limit uh, that sets a default uh, CPU and memory size for a particular, uh, for containers, uh, as well as a default request. And these are actually uh, a little bit different uh, because uh, if you were at Kubricon and you uh, watched the uh, the keynote there, you can you actually learned that the um, the default and the default request are slightly different because you can actually do uh, kind of bursty rec behavior. So the default request is what you think that your your process is going to be using, but the hard limits are actually up here in the default. So in this case, we're saying that the default uh, application is likely to use uh, 200 mega uh, megahertz of the CPU or 200, what is this? I think it's megahertz. Um, and uh, and the, uh, what's that? Millicores. millicores, okay, yes. So the uh, so this is actually 200 millicores, so that's like 0.2 cores essentially. And then this is a, uh, this is 0.2 or 0.3 cores. And so uh, you can actually, your application will be assigned two millicores or 200 millicores, but it'll actually, it can actually burst up to 300 millicores. And uh, the same goes for the memory. So most of the time, your, your application will be allocated 100 memory, but it can actually burst to uh, 512 megabytes. So if you don't actually specify when you create a pod or, cont or uh, a container, uh, you don't specify these, these limits. Uh, these limit, or if you don't specify limits on the CPU and the memory, then these default limits will actually get uh, assigned to it. So I'm going to go ahead and create those as well. Uh, I had these already in there. <laughs> so. What is it? The name of it. It's named the limits. Front end prod. Hmm. <coughs> ah, yes. I didn't create it in the right namespace. And So now I've created the limits, and those are going to apply to pods when they don't actually have uh, limits associated with them. Uh, but in my particular case, I'm going to create a resource controller, and I'm actually going to assign those directly here. So here I'm going to assign, uh, assign it directly in the resource controller template for my containers that uh, I'm going to give it 250 millicores and uh, 250 megabytes each for the, for the memory. And then I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to create uh, five replicas. And I'm just going to create five replicas of, of my of Nginx, uh, so that I can, can kind of illustrate a point. But uh, it doesn't really matter necessarily what's inside of them. So I'm going to do to create the uh, resource controller or replication controller. Okay, so now I've created a replication controller, and that should create five pods for me. So here we go. Let's see. Uh, get pods. I just set the context for this, but. Okay, so I should have five pods, but I'm actually getting four here, so that's kind of interesting. So, um, so when you set limits on on. For, for different types of, uh, for, your, for your pods or for, uh, um, for your namespaces, uh, it, you could actually get to the, into a scenario where you can't actually create the, the right 
the number of pods that you actually want to be able to create. Uh, so there's a number of reasons why that might be. Like maybe you have a set of, uh, you've got a set maximum for the number of pods that you've set for your, for your uh, namespace. Or maybe you're running out of memory or CPU that you've been assigned, uh, that you've assigned to it. So um, it can be kind of hard to debug like why this is actually happening. Like why don't I have five, uh, five running? So let's go ahead and try and debug this a little bit. Uh, so you can actually um, start out by just checking the, uh, the quota um, for the quotas that are installed for the particular namespace. Okay. So here I have the name here, and if I say uh, describe quota, front end quota. Okay, so here this is, uh, if you use the describe command from Kube control, you can actually uh, see uh, the, the used resources as well as the hard limits for it that are set with that particular quota. So here I can see that like one CPU is being used, uh, but I have a hard limit of two, so that should be okay. Um, and the number of pods is okay, but if you look here, like the the amount of memory that's being used is actually really hard, close to the hard limit. So this looks pretty uh, suspect. So let's uh, actually get the events for my namespace. So this actually, um, let's see, get events. Um, this will actually list the, the events that have happened uh, in Kubernetes. So when pods are created or destroyed or things like that, uh, you can get uh, a list of the events that have happened recently. And so here we can see that like all of my, uh, my pods have been created uh, successfully, but then at the bottom we can see that there's an error creating the pod. Um, so if you were actually creating the pod directly, uh, you, would, you would actually be told right away that the pod uh, can't be created because uh, it doesn't. You're going over the limits for your namespace or for the uh, for the actual pod, um, and it would tell you the reasons. Uh, but when you create a replication controller, it kind of does it like creates the pods by proxy, and so you don't really actually know what's going on right away. Um, so you actually go, need to go in here and check the events. And so here it looks like the uh, that we're limited to one gigabyte memory, and the uh, and we're actually rubbing, running up against that. So so uh, what I was suspecting was actually correct. We are kind of running up against this uh, this limit. Uh, so let's go back to our quota and bump that up to see if we can actually fix this. And then do Kube control replace uh, quota f front end quota space and prod and then go ahead and replace the quota. And then if we describe this, it takes a second to actually update this. Okay, so now it's actually, uh, it's actually updated to a hard limit of, uh, of two gigabytes. Um, so we should be good now. And Okay, cool. So now it's actually created five pods up for me. Uh, so that's kind of like one of the ways that you can kind of debug and manage like an, uh, a namespace uh, so that you can actually do like kind of cross-team development. Uh, so uh, because you're setting the limits on, on a particular namespace, uh, you're actually uh, setting the hard limits for that namespace so that other people uh, that who are using your cluster uh, won't be affected by you using up too much, too many resources. And so that way you can kind of actually isolate things uh, so that uh, multiple people can actually uh, use the same set of resources uh, all at the same time. Uh, so with that, I'll actually uh, end my demo because I think I'm out of time. But uh, if you have some questions or, or anything like that, I might be able to take them or, or two minutes maybe, okay. Uh, so I can maybe take a couple of questions, or um, and you know if we run out of time, then I can just answer those uh, later uh, after we when we're eating pizza and stuff like that. Anybody have any questions? You mentioned something about contexts. Contexts, yes, sort of under my breath, yes. So uh, okay, so um, Kube Control has the has this idea of contexts. Um, 
Yes, I will talk about it, but I'm going to show it, so please hold it. <laughs> Mike Mann. <laughs> no. He's actually more senior than me, so I shouldn't be talking this bad. <laughs> That's how this works. This is how that's how this works, isn't it? Yeah. So Kubi control has this uh, has this set of config. So um, has this idea of config. So um, the client actually has to do be like authenticated and stuff like that with the uh, with the API server in order to do any kind of commands and stuff. So like that's actually stored as part of the config. Uh, and as part of that, you have like what's called uh, contexts, and that can actually encapsulate uh, a set of uh, of authenticated. Uh, authentication uh, credentials, as well as uh, which API or server you're talking to, and uh, which namespace you're talking to, and um, and things like that. So you could change the whole context, uh, and you could be talking to a completely different API server or a completely different namespace. Uh, so you might use this to like manage your production production context and your uh, um, and your uh, your development context, or something like that, or um, your your home uh, Kubernetes cluster as and your work Kubernetes cluster, or something like that. So um, what you can actually do is set uh, within the config, you can set Kubi control config and uh, say set context, and this will set a uh, set a context, and you give it like a name, I think, and then. Uh, when you actually want to change contexts, you can set this use context uh, to actually change between contexts. Um, so if I do config list, um, and if you're, uh, I think it's view actually. Um, so if you're a person that uses uh, Google Cloud Platform like I am, uh, the the SDK that uh, you use um, that for Google Cloud will actually uh, pull, get the credentials, and then save them into the uh, context or to the config file for uh, for Kubi Control. Uh, and give you a context for that particular cluster that you've created in a compute engine. And it gives you a little name like this. Uh, it's really ugly looking, uh, but it kind of uniquely identifies the particular cluster that you're using. Uh, and then it gives you like certificate data and, and password and admin, or password and username for the UI and things like that. Is that answer your question? What's up? Yeah, hey, uh, so, you know, like, Nginx is essentially stateless, like minus the hash files. Yes. What, how does this abstraction work with something that needs data, and more specifically, like, local data, like the database? OK. So um, for things that need state and needs to stay, save state, like, kind of on, locally, like, on a file system, you can actually um, use something. Uh, you can't necessarily use, uh, I mean, you can, but, um, in, in general, like with, with ephemeral containers, you cannot uh, really save things locally, locally, meaning like on the same exact machine, uh, because the, the containers themselves could be like moved around or rescheduled somewhere else, depending on what happens. Like that node could completely go away. Uh, so usually what you would do is you would actually mount a, um, uh, basically something like a network file system. So like in a, like Compute Engine or, or um, on EC2 or something like that, you would mount a uh, a network disk or like EBS or um, or a, a persistent disk in cl in cloud platform. Or if you were on your own like uh, network, it might be like NFS or iSCSI or something like this. Okay, so if I if you have any other questions, like you can kind of catch me later and we can we can chat. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks very much.